hi everybody this is al phil reese at in quotes at the kelly writer's house this is a, a, a an event a reading by our friend our dear friend gabriel ojeda Segay, who's going to be reading tonight and this was a, a plan that we've had for months to make it possible for gabe to come back to philadelphia and we were going to do a triple header of events and just hang out and well we have done a triple header of events today. Okay. I'm so pleased to say. Gabe, welcome back Thanks, to Al. Writer's House Scene. I just want to uh, briefly introduce the program and just lay it out. Um, and I, most of all, I want to encourage those who are watching, the only way to watch is through YouTube. So those who are watching through YouTube, don't be shy. Use the, use the comment feed. Uh, we have uh, some staff here. Uh, Anthony and Rachel, who will be watching the comment feed, as will I. So feel free to comment throughout the reading. Uh, and um, there are already a number of people from far away. Sriya is in India at 3.30 a.m. I see our friend uh, Jeremy from, from uh, Wales is here. He's a dear friend of us. Deborah Josephson from the West Coast. So we have a lot of people there. Please feel free to comment. Uh, Gabe's going to be reading uh, uh, for about 35 minutes or so, uh, and then we're going to do a Q&A, which will entail some more reading, probably, as well. Um, and uh, Gabe has a book that's relatively new. It's a beautiful book called Losing Miami, and here it is. And uh, it's published by The Accomplices. It's very easy to find and buy online. We hope you will. Uh, Gabe also has a manuscript that he's going to be partly reading from. Uh, it, the manuscript is called M Madness, and it's to be published in 2022, but he's ready to read from it. And Gabe, I would invite you actually right now to uh, describe the book that's coming out next month that involves some visual art made by your uncle. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. Next month, Sobersco Press, which is an art book press here in Chicago, is putting out a collection of sketches by a um, person who was my uncle named Gustavo Ojeda, who was a pretty well-known New York artist in the 1980s uh, gay Cuban exile. Um, but he died from AIDS in the 18, I'm sorry, 1989. And kind of after he passed away, his legacy sort of fell out of renown. Um, he was an amazing night landscape artist. So urban nightscapes was his kind of main bread and butter, but he had these amazing kind of sketchbooks of mostly of people drawn on subways and things like that. So me and a good friend, Eric Kessel Jr. have worked to create that book and it is called An Excess of Quiet, Selected Sketches by Gustavo Heda, 1979 to 1989. I'm super excited about it. And we all are, I mean, you really have a lot going on and we didn't even mention your, your theoretical and scholarly work that you're doing. So it's, you're just an amazingly productive person. And we've seen that for years when you used to hang around the writer's house. So we're honored that you're here to read. Uh, without any further ado, I'd like to let you read for a while and then I'll come back and we'll ask some questions. I wanna remind those who are watching once again to please feel free to comment in any way, shape, or form you want. And especially as Gabe winds up the reading, please write your comments or questions and we will um, we'll use some of them in the Q&A, all right? Thank you very much, Gabe. Looking forward to this. So I'll introduce myself in a second, but I have many bad memoirs, I mean, uh, memories of times I had the undivided attention of my peers when I faked textures and enchantments, when I polished a little sea urchin, when I predicted my own humiliation. I've seen many complicated movies. Well, photographs, really. Or sometimes stories. I've written many bad photographs over recent years. My father, Junior, says, what good does it do to stand so close? Well, Junior, static energy. When my reflection and I meet without a mirror, I've had much heartbreak, I mean, uh, heartburn. I'm known in most circles for poor digestion and leisurely eating. When I sought out Corsica, I put it on a sorry little broadside so that I would not be led to Corsica. I wrote a terror on my terror, which led me to a successful autobiography in which I tell you all how I got here. My father drowned in a lake, 
the most divine chocolate cake. Hi, I'm Gabe Ojeda Sage. Um, that was a poem called Tell All. I like starting with it recently. Um, I'm really thankful to be here. Kelly Wright's House has been really important in my life and I'm not in it right now, which is very weird, but I'm through it in some sense. Um, I am happening to you all through it. <laughs> so anyways, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be reading. I am reading, as Al said, from my most recent book, which came out in the beginning of 2019 called Losing Miami, which was nominated for the Lambda, which I'm very happy about. Uh, and I'm reading from my book that's coming out next, my next poetry book called Madness. I also want to say, I mean, you can find Losing Miami by Googling it. Um, it's pretty easy to find. But also, I run an online shop on my website nowadays, sort of a COVID invention, where I sell my own books too. Uh, if you want to buy them from me, that's my last name without the hyphen, dot com, ohedasage.com. Ding! Um, I almost want to like Vanna White that if I had it in front of me, but I, I won't. So to tell you a little bit more about the next 35 minutes of your life, I'm going to read from Losing Miami first. I'm going to read uh, from about four different sections, but small pieces. And then I'm going to tell you about madness, which takes a little bit of explaining. And then I'm going to read from it. And I'm going to read from about three sections from that. OK, so let's start with the book. This is called Losing Miami. It's a book that tries to answer the question of what it would mean to grieve for the loss of Miami to rising sea levels. So it's a book about grief, but grief in a future tense. So that's kind of what's complicated about it. Something that's kind of happening now, but is also impending at the same time. And then to answer that question, I ended up talking a lot about um, Miami's condition of being made by people who have already left from somewhere else. So Miami is kind of a city of exiles. You'll see what I mean when I read from it. Losing Miami won. Start with sinking. I was raised in a city that could be swallowed by the sea within the next century. Start there. I rest in the sake of returning like drinking from the well. My spirit talks slobbermouth to you to see a ficus as the memory of an ocean. There is no shape to the frenetic odd nerves, the dogs on the other side of the fence, the thin film on the water, a single green bump in the middle waiting with one eye open, need for food. I'm hopeful about bakeries where periods hang like pearls, one word aiming at another. Solo lo plástico sobrevive, como siempre. Así forma un merengue de botellas sobre el agua. The shopping malls I used to walk around in, buying nothing, keep changing stores. A bird is full of egg whites and sings little remnants of the yard. Picking up pumpkin seeds off the side of the road where a woman was betrayed throwing shells. A la, me, a la puerta me, le meto los cuernos, el océano abrevia los rastros, little twisting keratin. I mistake one verb for another, unfortunate practice, butterfly my back. An eel sleeping in another eel. I want to think better, not a way to walk, wading through limestone, what the alligator wants, what residency is in its jaw. El avión, el avión, la vispa. I've got the name of an angel and windows with shutters. I've got a secret combination that I keep under my tile floor. Will you put your nose into my vents? They keep smelling like humidity. I really could use your help. An eel sleeping. I'm asked if I would go to Cuba now that policies have changed. When I ask my abuela the same question, exchanging irías for volverías, she says que no tengo nada que hacer en Cuba. Somehow I feel the same, even if I could never say volvería because I've never been to Cuba. Returning would not be the form in my case, but to grow up in Miami as the child of exiles is to always be returning to Cuba. Everything has a fragrant, not aftertaste, but third taste of Cuba. Angel Dominguez writes, what is the function of writing? To return home. But his gambit is that the flight home is the writing, the verb to return is the writing, not the home itself or returning to it. What is the function of writing? Quote, to return, quote. The answer is no, I would not go to Cuba because the Cuba I come from can only be returned to in the murmurs of the exile. I wonder what it would be like to be exiles from Miami, to have the city be an effect only of memory and simulation as Havana is for the Cuban exile generation. 
to have any description of the city be a dangling modifier, to have to put my antenna at the bottom of the ocean. Just as much as me and more. Francisco, bring me a tissue. I want to clean up the hairs on the floor of the bathroom. I want my friend to see me as someone he could love. I mean, really love. I want to get squeezed till I turn out dented like a pipe. If a lizard gets in the door, get him with a napkin. Let him live. Get him with a napkin. River monsters trudge behind pink life, ghostly guilt harmonics. Here's my selfish life. It is in your hands, as light as the keys and more so. One, imagine the loss of something small. Two, imagine the loss of something about your size. Three, imagine the loss of something very large. Do you imagine these differently? Is one more possible than another? What bodily responses do you have? Have you felt such things before? What are your first most immediate memories of these losses? Once my neighbor lost a watch, once my neighbor lost his father, once my neighbor lost his house, when a ficus fell on it. The next two poems are from a section called The Thousands, sort of vaguely about population. Relieve himself. If a man is seen fighting with another one over parking, and another man curses in Spanish over everyone yelling, and another man is hiding in the corner not involved, and another man is covering his kid's ears, and another man punches another man repeatedly, and another man is eating a medianoche watching, and another man is drunk watching, and another man is waiting to pass, and another man is allowing this to happen as the rest, and another man is a security guard, and another man is another security guard, and another man is asked if he needs help, and another man who is a security guard is cruel, and another man who is a security guard has a short temper, and another man who is a security guard beats a man, and another man is arrested for violence, and another man is put in the back of a car, and another man is cursing, puta, and another man is not invested, and another man is taking his kid for ice cream, and another man is drunk watching, and another man is not sure where he's going in that car, and another man is sure where he is going in that car, and another man is feeling betrayed, and another man is feeling victorious, and another man is feeling agonized, and another man is feeling anxious, and another man is inhumane, and another man is taking sharp turns, and another man is bleeding from his head, and another man is sitting on a curb with a security guard, and another man is offering another man first aid, and another man is saying pendejo, and another man is saying maricón, and another man is saying cabrón, then the parking lot is relieved because it has done its job. Fire ants. What a weak theory I've built for myself the daily hurricane in the refrigerator, not yet condensed. The Ziploc of fire ants, my tendency to trill, warmth against the door. I built such a life out of life, its doctored complications. I made this, these shapes of thin cheeks. I made the tropics into a thin circular theorem, but with a hand in their pincers, I'm starting to connect allergens to form a pyramid. So as probably you've noticed, the book is quite bilingual in more in other sections, much more so. I'm gonna read from a section that's like really fucking with that idea in general. So it's really kind of, um, I used to call it an anxious bilingualism. I still call it that, um, kind of a difficult bilingualism really. But I'm gonna read the translations. I just, because this book comes with an index in which I've translated everything that is in Spanish. Um, but you'll see like what I mean by translation. So let's, so this is two poems from that section. The first one is called Yo quiere decir sunburn. La lámpara magnífica quiere decir altura y pasteurize. Yo quiere decir sunburn. Yo también lavo el único núcleo tuyo as if matte hair was pasture. Y si, si me llevan pa'l rinconcito de esa luna, hay lunatic morons, una fila, my toenails sizzling over popping cedar. Esta vez no. Como si yo quisiera hablar de mal humor. Mata la planta, print up a clogged city. That flower is whiter than mine. It's a feathery comforter. No hubiera frito las manos si no viviera en la casa doblada. Yo quiero traerte, pero yo quiere decir sunburn. Y ahí es donde me tranco. Tal, 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 esa luna, esa, esa. And here's the translation of that. I means quemada. 
The amazing lamp means height and pasteurizado. I means quemada. I also wash your only nucleus, como si pelo mate fuera prado. And yes, yes, they take me to the corner of that moon there. There are idiotas lunáticos align mis uñas chisporroteando sobre el cero. This time, no, as if I wanted to discuss bad attitude, kill a plant. Prinupcial. Para una ciudad atrancada, esa flor es más blanca que la mía, es un edredón de plumas. I wouldn't have fried my hands if I didn't live in the doubled house, the dubbed house, the folded house. I want to bring you, but I mean quemada, and that's where I get stuck. Such, 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 that moon, that one, that one, that one. Okay, one more of those. Nieve de Miami. My lung is a critical thing, tender like veal. It's a record player. That moon there trae nieve, mucha nieve. Y se derrite y nadamos otra vez. My lung is sweet like veal. My eyes are round like a record player. Esa luna esa se derrite y nadamos, nadamos y cambiamos de lenguaje como monjes. Is that right? To re-meet a high school friend as if he was certainly volatile? Y él trae nieve y se derrite. And the translation of that, Miami snow. Mi pulmón es algo crítico, tierno como la ternera es un tocadiscos. Esa luna, esa, it brings snow, so much snow, and it melts, and we swim again. Mi pulmón es dulce como ternera. Mis ojos son redondos como un tocadiscos. That moon there, it's, it melts, and we swim. We swim and change languages like monks. Eso está bien. Reconocer un amigo de escuela secundaria como si fuera ciertamente volatil. He brings snow and he melts and it melts. And this is Losing Miami 4, which closes the book. We borrowed vodka from offstage squares, spent time pushing each other, drew straws to puke, left notes on each other's forearms, happened to matter, judged each other, got angry, drew weed on backs while I watched, thanked Jesus, drank and drank, insulted strangers, put it in plastic bottles, waited violet dreams off stage, slept in three sheets, scaled parking lots. I have a puzzle and a handful of tops, white rum and a handful of tops. As people in my life die, I have bad dreams. My head gets as small as my stomach. I see sheep in all the days I don't realize. A golden hand, wrapping paper. Between islands, pronounces potion. Let it be a weed in the drawers. Stopped hammering particles into clothing. Had the water isolate itself in his throat. That's the river, I said. No, that's the river. That one, absolutely. I thought it was, no, it's that. I put a capsule back in his throat, sucked the water back up, popped the bubble that is choking him. It grew blue in my room. It absolutely wished to be bigger. Puts a nest on a higher branch. One, imagine the loss of something small. Two, imagine the loss of something about your size. Three, imagine the loss of something very large. At different points in my life, I've considered these questions differently, told myself that small things were as huge as I made them in my spirit and that the large could be made small. A watch and a house were similarly sized if I instructed them to be. This is still true, but I've never asked myself, will not having a watch make me strange? Or where will I put myself if I don't have a watch? Or what will my mother do if I lose my watch? Or what watch will I be wearing tonight when everyone in the world is wearing theirs? An heirloom day started slowly, gets a track of anger through its center in reaction to one's own appetite, steadily impossible and sinking. I give this and other particles to my son who is laying on the beach. That's Losing Miami. So um, I'm gonna give a fair warning to Al and my, and my friends working this. I didn't set that timer I told you I'd set, so <laughs> I forgot to. So if I, if I become rebelliously over time, just stop me. You know I can handle it, so just stop me. So, okay, I'm gonna read from Madness and I wanna tell you about it first. So 
This book Madness that I've been writing and, and is, is done, but you know, is at press with Night Boat Books for early 2022. Uh, who knows what the world will look like, but that's okay. Is a fictional selected poems. And so what I mean by that is it takes the form of a selected poems, a selection of poems across a poet's career, but I make up the poet, I make up his career, I make up his books, I make up his poems, I make up his biography. So it's kind of, it's a narrative book. It's not a novel. It's a collection of poems, but it has this kind of conceit and this life to it, um, life inside of it. The poet that is the center of this book is named Luis Montes Torres, who is a Mariel Boatlift exile um, and a gay poet who lives from 1976 till 2035, at which point he dies of brain cancer. Um, so it, it is a little bit of a soft sci-fi in the sense that there is some work being done about the, the 2030s, the 2020s, um, and it's written by editors in the 2050s or something like that. I can't remember the exact date. Um, and so the narrative of the book chronicles his careers, his attachments, his writing, uh, his mental health especially, his world, his death, the jobs he takes, things like that. And the structure of the book is basically a little biographical sketch and then selections from a quote unquote book of his and then repeat biographical sketch, little selection of poems. I'm gonna read from this and I'm gonna read um, some of the poems from two books of his, one which is a book of love poems. So I'm gonna read just some love poems. And then the other thing I'm gonna read is, his, is from his last book, which doesn't really have a conceit. It's just sort of short, um, poems. And I'm also going to read from the middle of the book, which is kind of journal entries. And I'll explain that just a little bit more when I get there. The last thing I want to say about madness is it's kind of meant to be a narrative of a life that never really takes off in the way it desires because of the pressure of difference and crisis and ordinariness that that life experiences. And Luis is a person, Luis is a very sad person who gets very attached to fantasy, gets very attached to his um, a kind of self-centered view of the world in which he believes it kind of punishes him in a particular way. And he kind of works that out through writing and through attachments to particular people. He loves dogs for whatever reason. Um, and so it's a story about someone who is stilted in his position in the world. And I think you'll see that. Um, but the way I kind of think of Luis is having a kind of blanketing depression that also manifests as an incredible amount of awe at the world. So this is a person who really loves the world, but does not know how to feel satisfied with it. So that's the book. So, okay. I'm going to read some love poems. His life partner in the book is, is a, a man named Evan Bauer. That's the only, you don't know, you don't need to know that really, but I'm telling you that. Okay. Here's some love poems. Sessions. Obsessed with how long it takes for a glacier to melt or a movie to end. Taste of cream soda all I think about in the afternoons. You pass a finger between one tattoo and another. Find that I cannot make amends with every copper thread between my ears. I believe too much in spinning around. Plant matches and pray for a forest. When I am a creature soaked, ride on my back, ride on my back. Evan sitting in the chair that wraps him. Late energy makes the living room seem like a lawn. This light pressure on the uvula is a Holy Ghost finger, making us aware of when to lay our heads down, but we aren't there yet. A mottled flower sneaks over into his jeans while he's sitting in the chair that wraps him. With my sash on, the syrupy skeleton of storytelling, I'm just looking just telling him the differences that came out of a spent day, went, did, saw, told, acted, thought, and his felt, did, was asked. We take turns as the statue on call at the end of depend, fight off that white noise worry, turn the lamps on, let each other see slowly that there are only and always two of us here. This poem is called When I'm Afraid With You. It's also really heavily based. I feel like I should just give this credit. Uh, it's very heavily influenced by um, what I think is the best Charles Bernstein poem, which is Before You Go. 
Um, it's just a beautiful, beautiful poem. So anyways, when I'm afraid with you, converting a cactus into a spray when I'm afraid with you, convincing yarn to be kind to our animals when I'm afraid with you. I stop biting on blue lights when I'm afraid with you. You mince myth when I'm afraid with you. Covered in comfort, alone and together when I'm afraid with you. Careening and pearlescent, a moth, someone getting sick when I'm afraid with you. I'd laugh too, rubber wonder, as lenient as I can be when I'm afraid with you. Phone never answered, shakes and spurts on concrete when I'm afraid with you. I don't know, easy to admit, thin air touching your stomach when I'm afraid with you. We stage the opera where I am Rodolfo and you the delicate profile, unmoored, thrashing. And when I turn to you, as I must, I sing line, line. <laughs> okay. So this is, um, I'm gonna, now gonna transition to Luis's last book where his style kind of opens um, it's much less grounded in form, much less grounded in rhyme and things like that, which he gets pretty into in his mid-career. Um, it's called, the, the, the book in the book is called Some Shields, which was like a phrase I was obsessed with for years and I never knew why. So here's a poem called Lucky Coin. Reaching my hand across to Dennis, I notice books he has been hiding from me but cannot imagine giving up. A Coca-Cola on his dresser, a lucky coin, the way he speaks to me, when we are writing or when he asks for advice on his lesson plans, it is the polar opposite of face blindness. When I have sweat coming down my ears, it is a sign I am getting better at seeing my lion's image in a cloud. I depend very little on friendships, but need them. Nobody asks a whale the difference between itself and the ice caps. This is a poem called Method of Losi, a word that I have not decided how to pronounce, even though I wrote a poem with it in the title. Loci, Losi, whatever. Anyways, the plural of locus. How do I remember your name when the noise of the land is a scrambled half prayer sounding loud and high? Put it in a house in my mind. Though palpating the air in the dark for a sign, some noise, a ligature, everything is clear. Every year is drawn together like the bends in a paper fan. I touch my pinky to the soil. I almost think to sleep. Child is wishing on a pond for a girl's attention. There's no reason to take notes. No one has ever lied. An oil painting of a field with a detail of me forgetting all my life. And this is a poem called Tropical Negative. Keep your eye trained to the matador in this subplot. In my talkative history, how much has crumpled? What can next fry into someone else's life? Thousands of years down the line, when threats resurface as dreams, the diameter of what I have done. I am watching you set a match to my home. I move every body in this tradition. Absorbing the elegant foreigner in a wisecrack against the world, you treat me as your ghostwriter. I click my heels against an atmosphere. Against a hemisphere is actually the line. I click my heels against a hemisphere. I am ignorant in my best dreams. Tropical negative recorded as an injection of comedy. Do not tell your analysts, but I was born for this. The sun's advantage, my only preference, at a time like this, what to say, what to say, gamma ray, gamma ray. Okay, so that's poetry. And I'm gonna read what, I'm gonna read the journals that are inside of it. And I put journals in quotes because they're not journals, they're a poem, it's a whole thing, whatever, you'll get it, it's not a thing. And so the journals that I'm reading are from the year 2013 in the fiction of the book. And it's a difficult year for Luis. I'm gonna read from about January to about October, I think. Uh, there are 365 sections, but they're all about one line. And so in the text itself, I like bracket this in a way that makes a lot of visual sense. But in the reading, I have to show you how the days pass. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clap and it's gonna be weird, but it's gonna work. So I'm gonna clap every time a day passes. And anything that I say between a clap and a clap is what Luis wrote down that day. And he doesn't write down a lot for whatever reason. So 
2013. And this is the last thing I'm reading, by the way. So thank you for being here. I'm getting into running at the behest of a friend who I do not have time to talk about here. Today, incredible sky. Keep thinking every song I hear perfectly describes my life. It's a sign of a bad week. Newscasts hard to watch. Skateboarder on the street looked exactly like Evan. New book is not working yet. Figuring out how to change its rhythm. Today I'm having much empathy for younger versions of myself. Evan says I should try to do things that make me feel like me, but well, that's the problem. Today I saw the best dog. It's important to be able to tell what is cute in the world. Yesterday was less good than I thought now that I'm doing today, which is to say today is good, but I'm doing too much thinking about yesterday. Is invention possible? Today, believed I saw my brother in the mirror, but I do not have a brother. Sailing, that's one of his books. Sailing, coming along badly, but quickly. Do not know what to write, but am writing. Reading in a week in Chicago. Today I am writing while on a plane, thinner thoughts, better poems. Cannot stop thinking about the phrase explosive road, which I have made up today, and the Bersenbrugge line, a single emotional line of oneself in one time like a wind that comes up. I am easily attached. Reading was okay, felt lonely, turnout was good, forgot to buy the other reader's book, but I did like her. I've been better. Today, totally gray, read a lot. I'm considering finding a relationship with my mother again. Might be a bad idea. Wish I played the clarinet, but happy today otherwise. Finished sailing today and sent it to Imelda. I must stop writing the same book over and over again. Pass this one out of me as if through a sieve. Feel unsure about it. Could kiss Evan for hours. Imelda seems happy with sailing. She wants to put lever on the back cover instead of blurbs because it's very good. She knows better than me. Imelda changed her mind and wants Martin Espada to blurb it. I asked her if it would be confusing since he is from Puerto Rico. Americans do not know much about difference. She says confusion helps sometimes. It has helped me many times. My recurring dreams. One, reading a book that feels magical to speak out loud but has no meaning. Two, choking my father. Three, stuck back in high school. Had the first one of these last night. That book is amazing. Espada said, yes, would love to be named Sword. Evan bought a shirt today that makes him look like a waiter. I told him so, but he says he likes it. Do not miss Virginia winters. 68 degrees today in LA, thank God. Sailing coming in June, fast. Today I feel like a videotape. Am I a good writer? Saw an air show today and enjoyed it, but now I keep imagining them crashing, trying to turn that off. Do frames matter that much in visual art? Lecture on frames today at the library and I'm still not certain. Sorry, was very busy. We'll get back into the habit. One of those days where I am totally listless, but for just one moment, I see everything very clearly. Today, I imagined flight in many forms. Wrote a poem today and I liked it. Deleted the poem from yesterday. When I die, I want to crackle about. On some streets of this city, I feel like I get hives. I think my questions about boats are getting boring. Evan and I spent all of today at a museum where I saw the most beautiful painting I've ever seen in my life. I don't remember what it was called. Evan is obsessed with Rothko. One of those days where Evan and I took up space as if it was a way of communicating with each other. The, weekends felt, the weekend felt like a small victory. Pet a dog today. At night, I do not believe in anyone.
have a friend I am in love with, but I am in love with many, many men. Sometimes I hit myself on the head to relax. Things are complicated. At work today, I watched a couple movies. It was a slow day, waiting for Guffman and some like it hot. Sometimes I am like a dislocated shoulder. Today, sky perfect and for an hour, pink. After much deliberation, I have decided music is better for other people than me. I have little to say today, bought yarn. Tried making visual art today, made me happy. From my apartment, I heard someone on the street getting hurt. Went to the beach with Evan. I explained why I say the Pacific Ocean is a hallucination of the Atlantic. He laughed and tossed sand on my nose. Great dog today, brown and black and playful. Red Skyler on the way to work, life is impossible. I brought my friend lemonade today because she is down. The rain today was a gift. Red today in Las Feliz with three others, many good poets here, terrible wine at the reading. Slow morning from the weed last night, breakfast of rice, eggs, adobo. Nikki Giovanni line, I turn myself into myself. Lecture on recycling plastic at the library, thought about my toothbrush. Tomorrow we launch sailing in LA, then two days after in New York. Think I have finally figured out how best to read at rest and in a bottle, slanted and sagging, that's the secret. Sales are okay. Do not feel I have much energy to market it. Imelda is doing her best. Hate chihuahuas. Saw three today, saw a cute pit bull, refreshing. Diana does not like the book, I can tell. The weather predictions were exactly right. Saw Elliot today for the first time in weeks. He made some time for him and I to be alone. I told him all I wanted was his forgiveness, though I feel I am owed much more. Sometimes I think I am driven to an embarrassing madness by men. With Elliot, with many other men, I feel as if I become a yearning and a talent for tenderness. Tenderness as in being easily chewed. Should stop writing my name on books I own. Conditions of possibility, who first said that? The light in this apartment, a miracle on certain days. At this point, I am so deeply rooted in Evan. Though there are days when I would like to run away, there are also days when I feel attached to any object he touches. Need to remember groceries and a good run today. Richard Blanco and I had coffee today. Ha ha, he's very nice to look at. Reading Euripides in bed for the better portion of the day. I am 37 today, wish we had pets. Dream last night, in a field I am standing, I apologize to someone I do not see and I begin to fly. Some things I am thankful for today. The coffee Evan makes, 75 degrees. Spicers after Lorca. Evan's recurring jokes. The Pacific Ocean. That the frisbee tossed by college kids missed my head. That my stomach has settled a bit. Fania All Stars, a nighttime drive with my friend. Over eggs, my friend of many years said, you forget sometimes that there are other people around you. The opposite of the problem, I think, but I know what she means. Every year, September's coming surprises me. D.H. Lawrence, there is a sticky universal pitch that I refuse to touch. Traffic's so awful today, I almost got out of the car to sit on my hood. Wanted to yell the whole way home. With a friend today who moved five years ago from Venezuela, we went out to the movies. At some point, I made a joke to which she replied, that's because you're American. When did I become the American? Do I believe in ghosts? Saw the tallest dog I have ever seen today. Amazing. Today I felt like a very young version of me. Not a bad thing this time. I felt like a version of me that recovers. Impossible to compare brands of cereal on most days. Evan is sleeping and I am trying to learn how to play the guitar. 
A child at the park told me I was, quote, very handsome, quote. Helped Renata build a deck chair today. Who would have thought? Me. I think it turned out all right. Maybe I would be like this in any country. Increasingly convinced I have very much in common with dandelions, though I know that I sound like a sissy when I say that. At a farmer's market today with Evan and did not find cubanelle peppers. I told Evan it would be better if he would just make pork chops for Renata instead. Night drank. At the library, I found a book of spells and thought something similar might make for a good next book. Must abandon this boats theme. Tonight saw Elliot, who apologized to me. Felt good to hear that. I'd been waiting for it. We sat in silence for a few minutes after. Felt like strings were pulling me towards him, though I didn't move. I hate this familiar feeling, potential energy. Somewhere, excuse me, somewhere, someone in another country is playing soccer. Somewhere, someone in another country is thinking of naming their child Luis. At the beach with Evan, I swore the ocean and him were made of the same incredible yarn. I use the water at the beach as a tuning fork. I flick it and I try to set my brain to its pitch. Thank you all. That's all for me. Gabe, that was marvelous. I'm so excited about Madness. You sent me the manuscript recently, which I read, but hearing the poems and the diary are marvelous. And I thought we would do is for now, what I'd like to do is just quote some of the praise. And okay. There'll be some quasi questions in there, but I want to ask a couple of my own questions and then we'll take questions from the chat. But for now, I just wanted to give you a sense of what, what people are saying. Uh, these poems are amazing, says Heidi from the writer's house. Uh, David Biro, I built such a life out of life, so good. Anxious bilingualism, lots of people saying that. You can always come home. Uh, another man, Stein-like multi-view, repetition, great. Love how the translation is more exchange, keeping both languages. This is great, says Jayla Rhodes. The interplay of two languages is wild, says Jason D. So great to hear Gabe read it live and in person, in persons in quotes. <laughs> Briar Essex, thrilled to hear you reading these. The cadence is like a conversation. Agree, says Judy Suhu, who's from Modpo. Uh, uh, Spanish is very lyrical and musical. Amanda, wow, wow. Jayla, no timer, no problem. <laughs> Allison Frazier from Canada. I've got all night. Kim, holy crap, what an amazing reading. Love the linguistic play. Can't stop thinking about the idea of being exiled from language. Love, 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 anxious bilingualism. Sanjeev, you are going all Pessoa on us. <laughs> Fair. Uh, MC, I love the idea of this book, Cave, and the world that you've created. Um, Yikes, this is getting very personal for me, says Allison. Shari, Gabe, please do an audiobook. Your voice is wonderful. Jayla, I, I feel lucky to be listening to these. Uh, and um, uh, Jeremy, our friend Jeremy, says yes to that. Uh, and there's a couple of more like that. I just want to quote a few more. Um, wow, says somebody. Amazing to somebody else. That should be a blurb, like, on the back of it. Wow, says somebody. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, thank um, you to all of you and to you, Al, for reading this. So, anyway, um, I'd like to pick one repeated question from that group. Then I'm going to go to a couple of my own questions, and then we'll go back to pick up some questions from the audience. So let's talk about anxious bilingualism. Do you want to say anything more about it? Sure. Um, it kind of comes about, I had this thought, I don't know, I don't know how much I actually defend this position, but I'm going to now say this position because it's the position that inspired this work. There's this cliche about bilingualism and with learning another language where people say, um, oh, and now you know double about the world. You know, you pick up another language and you, you learn double what you knew before. Right. I get that. So, but I was thinking about what it, 
means to come into selfhood from multiple languages and how at times it can be almost um, disorienting and, 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 and difficult. And, and so I used to, to say at readings like, I wanna argue that being bilingual means you know half of the things you should know or something like that. I used to say something kind of polemic in that way and I'm not that attached to it anymore. But basically that was that was where that that list of that or that section of poems of the Jokire de Seed Sunburn came from. And then my the image that centralizes those poems is the sunburn. And I thought that that was kind of a nice image for thinking about bilingualism not as something that only like expands your knowledge to be incredible and amazing and super flexible, but also sets you into a relationship with the world that's kind of difficult and sort of strange. And especially in the US, which is a very mono, it's not a very monolingual culture, but it's a culture that has a lot of monolingualism and rewards monolingualism. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanna say about it is, I've been thinking recently about this Eve Sedgwick um, piece where she says, if Reagan, Ronald Reagan, is talking to, um, uh, I forget who the French president of the same time as Reagan was, but if he's talking to the French president. Bar Distang, Distang. Okay, so if he's talking to the French president and Reagan doesn't know French, but the French president knows English, the French president is the one who's forced to speak from a position of, an, of a second language and that Reagan gets to kind of like weaponize his ignorance. Oh, yeah. And so that was, that's really interesting to me. And so it, it's kind of one of these things where I think about what's at stake in describe, being able to kind of come into subjecthood by dis, in describing the world. And so nice. those poems are really trying to be just really disjunctive and really kind of nasty and difficult. And mm -hmm. um, the last thing I want to say, I know that I'm talking longer than you want me to on this no, one. No, I want to talk. The one that I, the last thing I want to say is there's this cliche in, Latino writing, which is the kind of bringing in of the bilingual word as a sort of fetish object. And so there's like so much Latino writing out there that's like, excuse me, I'm gonna do such a bad parody to many people I consider my peers, but <laughs> I have a lot of respect for this. That's my point. But there's a lot of Latino writing that's like, I see my abuela who is making frijoles. And so I'm kind of like, I'm trying to take that, but make it just so kind of troublemakery and just kind of nasty. And that's why you get the, the Spanish word will be something like, I think in, the, in that first one, the first um, word in a different language is pasteurized, which is like such an unattractive mm. word. So that's the kind of things I'm dealing with there. I want to ask a follow-up question about anxi the anxiety here, because I think anxious bilingualism, as you've defined it, so far works for so many important bilingual and trilingual poets. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know, take Paul Ceylon, who's actually a quadrilingual poet, but, you know, really uh, thought about German as the language that killed his family and therefore yeah. he had to inhabit it. Mm -hmm. But, but Cuban anxious bilingualism or bi anxious bilingualism that that raises itself in Miami around with people who who left Cuba for essentially political reasons almost entirely uh, and so that there's a special added anxiety to that because because of permanent exile mm -hmm. uh, during the Castro years you know and you grew up in them uh, means home doesn't home is a very funny concept yeah so and so it's anxiety squared i think is what yeah. I'm well i think so i mean partly uh, so the book begins with this like note on language which was actually which was actually an editorial um a suggestion by by the team at the accomplices was like maybe you should have something that kind of addresses the languages of the book yeah and in it, in it i talk about like the fact that the language system of the book is realistic to the kind of language system of Miami, which is just so sonically multi-layered, um, especially when you add in like how much Haitian Creole there is in Miami. But so it is realistic, but I'm really playing a lot of games with it. And I'm trying to, I think my approach to dealing with, I'm a very problem oriented poet in the sense that I, I come at a poem with like, with a problem and I say, how do I want to think about this thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So with this book, I was really trying to think about if, there, if, if the stake of um, sea level rise in Miami is the possibility of losing Miami as a home, what does it mean to say that your home is Miami? For, for a lot of people 
who hold Miami as their home, that's already really fraught, as you're saying, you know, because you might, in my case, like grow up with a kind of family that speaks of Cuba as a place that is always kind of really concretely in their memory and in their imaginary, but that they don't actually have interest in going back to. It's not like they're like, Oh, worse than that, more than that did. They, yeah. Not only do they want not want to go back, but they are pissed off. Yeah, and like the, the, the Cuba that they also are remembering is not really a thing that exists. So this is like the weird thing as, as a child of exiles is you're like interfacing with a moment in time that's being carried more and more into the present. And so like for me, it's like my, my grandparents are 60s exiles. And so for the 80s, 90s, 2000s and onward exiles, it's very different. But um, my family is very like Castro comes into power out and um, for them, it's like the 60s Cuba is what's constantly being referred to. And so it's very kind of hard to interface with that home. And so I'm, I always, I kind of think of it as like, I built my foundation on yeah. something that isn't really there. Right. And so that's like what I think is at stake in saying, okay, now what if people had to leave Miami? What if people had to exile from Miami? A thing that is really happening in the sense that already we're seeing people buying property in higher altitude area codes. And it's kind of funny because the higher altitude area codes, such as Overtown, are historically poorer neighborhoods. But now when people are realizing the kind of uh, possibilities that might happen to lower altitude neighborhoods, which tend to be the richer ones, the rich are buying from these poor neighborhoods and displacing the, the historically poor in Miami. It's all very complicated. So anyways, that's, yeah, that's what's going on there. Um, so there is a psychology here. Um, I think the Luis work is more overt about the psychological dimension of what you're thinking about, but there is a psychology in losing Miami. And it goes something like this, I think. Um, language is a return. Mm -hmm. You say that in Losing Miami 1. Mm -hmm. uh, language is return. And of course, return presupposes a sense of where you're going back to, home. Mm -hmm. So in fact, if you will, you have a copy of the book, obviously you read from it, uh, page 21, where there's some quasi-theoretical prose about this mm -hmm. in Losing Miami 1. Uh, you quote, what is the function of writing, which is a quote, I guess, quote from Ron Silliman's Albany, or... No, no, it's from Angel Dominguez. What, what is the function of writing is, well, I mean, he might be referencing it, I guess. I think he is, yeah, yeah. 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 It's Black Lavender Milk, it's a great book. So, to re the answer is to return, parentheses, home. Mm -hmm. But his gambit is that the flight home, that's exile, it, reverse exile, I guess, return, is yeah. the writing. The verb to return is the writing, not the home itself, or returning to it. Okay, I, yeah. I want you to say more about it, and I guess I'm asking you to make it personal because I do think that you are wrestling with losing a place that your people came to, mm -hmm. losing a place that's home for you, but not for them in some kind of vague exiles sense. Right. right? I mean, the thing about the, the Bay of Pigs was, you know, we imagine being able to return home Right. But that was like 1961. It's a long time ago, long before you came to the to the planet. So I think one what's going on there and maybe I'm actually going to reverse your formulation where you said language is a return. I also think return is a language in the sense that I think this book supposes that sometimes literally physically returning to a place is not returning to that place in the sense that often the way you return in the way that's satisfying to you is not going to involve actually going to the place that once was the thing you wanted it to be, you know, because of the problems of time and the problems of change and the problems of sociopolitics. And so I think about the, you know, the, the, the book, somebody once told me that losing Miami could be called leaving Miami, or maybe they said should be called leaving Miami. And it's true that in the set, that that my leaving Miami is really relevant to the book. And I visit Miami a lot, not during COVID times, but I visit Miami a lot. And I think about how every time I come back to Miami, it's like, oh wait, the, the thing that I think I'm returning to is not there. It's actually the object is gone and the flight is not what's getting me there. However, the languaged process 
that I'm in a call return can get me there in some ways. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is part of the, what's at stake in the global climate crisis, which is a lot of people are being displaced from various places, not just Miami. I'm just taking one example here. And we actually are gonna be constantly thinking about what return, what the conditions of return are for those people. I mean, I think you are somebody who's thought about this a lot, right? Coming from genocide studies, like this is not an easy question to answer. And for a lot of people, return or memory is very troublesome. So this is the, and it's, and it's I'm thinking towards the future, but obviously using these past situ yeah. uh, situations to, to guide me. Yeah. Let me, one, one more follow-up and then uh -huh. on this topic, because it's so interesting. And then I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll through some questions and you can pick one or two questions that people have asked. And okay. Just answer. Um, okay. So if, if your, if language is returned, if you buy that to any degree, but, but there is no there there to go yeah. back to, not for your generation, you're always already going back to back to a thing that's an absence. It reminds everybody of an absence, exile. Mm -hmm. um, that's very different from the previous generation. Mm -hmm. uh, that somehow coincides with the eco disaster of losing the place that was the place where Cuban Spanish came mm -hmm. and then for you ceased to exist as a thing to go back to. And in a funny, funny way, Gabe, and forgive me for putting it this way, um, you are, your Spanish is exophonic yes. in a funny way. Because first of all, you're going back to a language of, of your family. Yeah. And that's a funny thing to say to, of a poet who is really bilingual, at least in this book. Mm -hmm. And to choose to be exophonic. I mean, uh, Ceylon chose to be exophonic in a weird way because he's living in France. Mm -hmm. uh, but speaking a language that wasn't his anymore, but that had been murderous mm -hmm. and had caused disappearing. So I guess I'd ask you to comment on that strange yeah. formulation. I see what you're saying. I mean, one of the things that's weird about my writing in Spanish is that it's tr I'm kind of referencing my, my Spanish personally is, and this is true for a lot of first generation Americans, it's weird because it's partly what might be called American Spanish. Like a thing that doesn't totally exist, a category that doesn't totally exist, but certainly does. And my accent is like, it's, it's Cuban and Puerto Rican a little bit, but it's mostly Miami. -um. And so it becomes its own thing sort of, sure. but, it, but it's not always recognizable as such. Um, and I think that often my, writing in Spanish, which is more limited than my writing in English, but I do it at times, is often kind of troublesome because it looks like it, it looks native to a place that shouldn't be native to Spanish or like is still um, negotiating its relationship to being native to Spanish. Right. I, think of, I think of the US as a Spanish speaking country, like not exclusively obviously, but I do think of the US as a Spanish speaking country. But that's a problematic notion for a lot of people. I wanna say on the, I mean, on what you were saying, like one of the theses of the book in joke form is that Miami doesn't exist. And that even though it doesn't exist, it's incredibly important to everybody who lives there. So it's like the book is trying to figure out how did we make a relationship to a place that was really built on echo and on absence and on memory already? And then how did we get attached to that? Because now it matters, you know, like, now Miami is its own thing, even though it still has these echoes, this third taste, but it still matters and there's all these attachments. So it still poses a lot of problems. And so it's probably my most researched book in the sense that I was really like trying to figure things out. And I was trying to kind of understand the actual lived experience of the climate yeah. crisis. Yeah. But so yeah, I think that answers the question. It really does. Um, I, I just want to put a marker on the possibility either in this session or when we have a chance to talk one on one that Ricky, Ric your feelings about Ricky Ricardo might actually say a lot about this. But yeah. let's let's let me just scroll through some questions and you can pick you can pick some questions. Um, does Gabe want to riff on Jimmy Schuyler, who appears <laughs> in one of the things? Um, 
how are the madness poems laid out on the page? Is there a visual equivalent of the clap? You can explain that pretty easily. Yeah. Curious about how the book is presented given the narrative. You provided us with a lot of backdrop. Is there a scene setting in the book? This is about Luis's book, Madness. Mm -hmm. Or is it all done through poems? Um, and uh, let's get a couple more into play here. Um, can you speak a little bit about the relationship between to return home and language? Well, we just talked about that. That was from Kim. What does it feel like to look back on older poems and older writing? Oh, that God. would be an interesting question with respect to how madness is going in relation to losing That's true. Yeah. Uh, I think I'll stop there. There's a bunch of questions in that. Go, take it where you want yeah. to. So I'll, I'll quickly speak to the organization of madness. Um, Madness is, because it's a fictional selected of poems, it has an introduction by the editors. The editors don't exist, but um, it has an introduction and a, a sort of preface. Um, and actually a lot of work for that function, a lot of the, a lot of, um, excuse me, doing a lot of work for the function of introducing the conceit of the book are yeah. kind of facing covers that I've made where, I don't know how it'll be in the end book, but there's the cover that says sort of madness by Gabriel Ojeda Sagué for Jabril, my husband. And then the next page says madness, the selected poems of Luis Montes Torres, da 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 edited by uh, Angel de la Escoba and uh, somebody de las Palmas. I can't even remember my editor's names, my fake editor's names. And then for Evan. And so there's already that kind of introduction to the introduction and then the preface to the book, I was thinking about reading it, talks about the start of Luis's life, um, being born in Cuba, the Marielle Boatlift, and it signals actually um, what comes towards the end of the book, which is the, his mental fallout. Mm -hmm. And then, um, which happens in this very slapstick way where like, he's like a dog walker for a while and it's a whole thing. Anyways. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> he's a dog walker and he gets dragged by like six Labradors into traffic. Anyway. Oh, in LA by that point? No, at that point he's in Philly actually. Um, so he goes, he, after he goes from Cuba, he goes to Fairfax, Virginia, DC, then LA, then Philadelphia. Um, so anyways, um, and then the other thing that it does is it literally says like, this is the construction of the book as if it were a real editor's introduction. So it's kind of mimicking that language of, of book publications. And then with the journals, what it is is is, is um, a pipe. So literally like a typographical pipe divides each of the days. So it looks like this kind of gargantuan prose block, but it gives this kind of internal texture that I really like. Um, it's something I learned from a lot of prose poets and the ways that they divided their clauses because at a certain point, the sentence becomes a little bit less useful for prose poetry. Yeah. Um, I think actually Harriet Mullen is one of these people who does, you know, who kind of really plays with this. So that's the organization of that book. And, you know, I'll say to something that Al, you were saying earlier, it is a very, it's a very psychological portrait, but it's also a very formal one in the sense that it's really invested in poetry's forms, but also the forms that different kinds of living and belonging take. So it's like really lose like, trouble is that he's always he's constantly trying to find like ways he belongs but mm -hmm. constantly feels unsatisfied by them and feels mm -hmm. like a need to constantly push that more and more right. and it's not his fault it's 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 the fault of the sort of the ordinary crisis of living in the united states but um but that's really what the the psychology is also a consideration of the poetic form right and then i don't I don't know. I think that's the what I would take up from there. Um, I love James Schuyler, and I don't remember what the very last question was. I don't either, but they were I good. Love Ricardo, so uh, <laughs> let me try. Let me try a ratio out on you, uh, because the, the the underlying question is going to be something like, and and it's partly from the comments, and partly from my head, uh, the relationship between Gabe and Luis. Uh -huh. uh, and I guess I'm going to formulate it this way, a little provocatively. Okay. Um, as I was reading both manuscripts or the book and the manuscript that you sent me, all I kept thinking was that Gabe is to Luis as losing Miami is to madness. 
Sure, I like that. I do. I think that's not provocative, actually. I think that's, I think that makes sense. Uh, here's what I'll say about the difference because, you know, it is in some ways, there is some autobiographical parts and pieces to it, but actually it's much more kind of based on, it's a collage of biographies of exiles that are important to me. So there's some of my uncle's life story in it. There's yeah. some of my father's life story in it. There's some of the life story of the writer Reynaldo Arenas, who's a poet I really admire. Um, an amazing Mariel Boatlift exile who died of AIDS. Um, it's complicated to say he died of AIDS because he killed himself, but, um, but I would say he died of AIDS. Um, and then of, of, of some other Latino poets who are important to me. So it's kind of a collage biography of trying to get at what it might be to like what is the story of like a gay latino poet what does that look like how does that move in the world and it does have a lot of me i mean a lot of the things that lose mental health becomes are based in like some mental health issues that i have struggled with but what i'll say is the main difference between lou and i and and it really appears in the form of the book is that lou is a very sad person a very kind of heavy person who finds has trouble finding humor in things. Like he's mm -hmm. kind of, um, he's almost like, this is gonna be the weirdest analogy. And I feel like only Al, maybe you'll follow me on this. It's okay. kind of like Jude in Jude the Obscure. Oh Jude, yeah, like, that's good. That's like good. he's like, you know, it's that kind of like, never really succeeds in the way that he wants to, but. Yeah. And I'm like really attached to humor. I mean, these, I, these two books are my like sadder books, but like, I like kind of a campiness and the, editor's work on uh, in the Lou book is like much more comic relief, more sort of funny than Lou's actual poems, which are very um, more heavy. And I should say like one of the kind of like comedic moments is that Lou like very bored working as a librarian in Los Angeles enters a contest hosted by the Kellogg's Corporation um, where Kellogg's is looking for a new um, kind of like marketing campaign for their frosted mini wheats. And so they are like, we want poems about frosted mini wheats. And Lewis is the only, Lewis is the only person who enters. And I believe that the poem is the sight of white in the morning is a miracle. And that's <laughs> it. And I just like found that funny. And so I wanted it in there. And, and that's kind of the his biography is actually sort of absurd. His poetry is where he's like a little bit more morose, but there's a heaviness to Lou and a, and a stuckness to Lou that I don't think exists in my other work. And I think it's reflected in the, in the poetic forms themselves. Well, you are, uh, uh, his relationship to Mariel Boatlift is so, makes him so different from you. Right. There's a dramatic past. Yeah. Right. And, and that, you know, you could call the madness that comes at the end. I don't, you know, I don't really fully understand it, what causes it, but you could call that a, a much delayed post-traumatic. Is that's absolutely what it is. And no, it's totally what it is. And for me, the map, like I picked the name madness because it's so big as to be kind of meaningless. Like it's such a yeah. cliche word. And I yeah. liked it because it forced you to read the madness into a lot of places that it wasn't obviously there. So like he does have several kinds of breakdowns, but actually you see the madness in so much else you see the madness in like the social circles that he runs and you see the madness in like the kind of sociopolitical things that happen to him and his like he's like one of these poets who's very attached to poverty out of some kind of righteous feeling and sure um it comes up a lot like and really i think what's mad about it is how like is is basically the just the the kind of inability to find that right harmony. And, and towards the end of his life, right before he dies, he finds it a little bit by looking towards uh, nature and kind of Zen. And, and it's sort of a false answer, um, mm. but he finds it in this like last little moment and then, and then he dies. And so the book kind of ends with an anti-climax that I really like. And so I hope when it comes out into the world, people like it and, yeah. and people kind of get its vibes. I have one last question. I'm going to ask the uh, those who are watching and commenting in the feed to do something. I'll ask them to do something in a second. But okay. uh, before I get to that, the reason I made that somewhat silly ratio was that I was 
I keep thinking that you are doing what is a what is a natural thing for, and pardon me for calling you a mid-career poet at this point, but <laughs> I, I like it. I mean, it guesses when I will stop, which yeah, I like. I, oh, 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 I didn't mean that, but, but <laughs> Luis, Luis, you know, you're projecting a career. Yes, right. A poetic right. career in Luis. It's something that's an interesting thing to do as you get to the point where you've put out a bunch of books and you're known as a poet and, you know, you're nascent, your academic career is nascent. Yeah. Uh, you're a PhD student but your poetic career is real, it's happening, and you keep, you keep it up. And Luis is kind of projecting a pretty weird course, yeah. one that you won't follow because someday there'll be, a, there'll be an academic position for you and you'll be able to have both <laughs> the best of both worlds. So I don't, I'm not requiring an answer to this question, but I think there's a certain amount of projection. So if, if, uh -huh. if Gabe is to Luis as lo losing Miami is to madness, then you're trying to figure out where you're going to go. And you're going to, obviously, you're not a Mariel boat person, so you're not going to end in post-traumatic stress, but there's a certain amount of anxious bilingualism. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think one of the considerations of the book is actually just to talk about, like, career trajectory. That anxiety, it shows up in the journals. It's a very small part of it. But, like, the, he says, like, I need to stop writing about boats. Is like, um, it's very real to me. I feel like madness is... I actually, this is maybe being too guessing, like putting the cart before the horse or whatever the expression is, but I feel like madness is the end parentheses to some considerations that I have had. Yes. And I feel like I've really got, it's kind of the culmination of a lot of questions that I've had that I now feel I'd like to move on from. <laughs> and so madness for me ends a work. Yes. And so I'd like to move forward from that. And so what's funny about it, and this is just to talk about publishing for a second, is like, I finished this in 2019, and it just so happens it's coming out in 2022 because publishing takes time. And honestly, if it was gonna come out earlier, it probably would have gotten delayed because of COVID. So like things happen as they will. But I remembered that the last question that both you and I forgot is the question of what it's like to read older poems. Mm -hmm. And the weird thing about putting out a book that like, people don't know until they put out a book is like the gap between when people are reading it and when you're making it and obsessively reading it is so large that sometimes you get exhausted by your own material. Yeah. So I have not really gotten exhausted by it, but I know my way around this like very well. And I know like what works. I could tell you like exactly how long each section takes for me to read, but um, it does take, I think it, it lets you kind of reflect on like if you are a poet with a project and you're like i really want to accomplish these things mm. in the next you know x amount of years or books or whatever which i'm very much that kind of person it's like control freak then revisiting the old stuff helps you because you're like where have i been and i feel like actually and i don't mean to be like tooting my own or anyone's horn like you kind of surprise yourself because also people find things in your books that you didn't know about or you forgot about and people get passionate about things and they're like, wow, I really noticed this. And you're like, crap, awesome. Somebody wrote a paper about losing Miami that is oh, all about God. limestone. And I was like, what? That's awesome. <laughs> I like limestone sort of in an abstract way. Um, but yeah, so that's it. That's all I have. That's really exciting. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm because there's a delay so in the sense that you and I are talking at a certain moment and the it's That's coming to YouTube yeah. a little later. I'm going to say ask everyone now who's watching, uh, and I grant that Sriya started at 3:30 a.m. her time in <laughs> India, and Clarice Cl Clarissa Stein is in Australia, which is yeah, it's uh, it's morning. It's finally morning there. Um, I'm going to ask those folks just to say goodbye or to you know, post a final thought uh, or a farewell or just, so I'm going to ask everybody who's, who's interested in chatting just to put that up and that's the way we'll end. But in the meantime, while they're doing that, I want to ask you about Ricky Ricardo and that would be, yeah. it's, uh, it's page 92. You didn't read the Ricky poem. No. But I just want to, I just want to ask you to read a couple of stanzas from it and then talk about it because Batista makes an appearance and yeah. So it's on 92. Would you read from What If I Wear the Apron? I love that, by the way. Yeah. Ricky is always wearing Yeah, that. right, exactly. Uh, down to Forget About Me 
on that page. Would you read that and then we'll talk about it? Sure, yeah. What if I wear the apron this month? People I place, they put in my corner store, I'd be a lamb for you. Batista is the mustache agency's PBX operator. I wanna dance with you in the same design. I'm a dipper from way back. In levity, it's like a volcano and a broom, blue ridicule. It is not a myth that I have upset Lucy, it is categorical. Ginormous couch is pregnant, forget about me. Yo, you're on mute, Al, you muted yourself. You must have muted me. Okay, let's talk about Ricky for a yeah. second. And if you want to bring Lucy and Batista in there, please do, because I want people, I really want people to read in this book, Ricky Ricardo is my bedazzled mom. <laughs> okay. Most ridiculous title in the book. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on Ricky Ricardo. Okay, please. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, so for me, Ricky Ricardo is like the first mediated like Cuban person that I saw on television. My father was obsessed with I Love Lucy and therefore I was obsessed with I Love Lucy. We used to watch it all the time. I've seen like every episode of that show. It's amazing, I love it. That's, you know, that's all I can really say about it. But so Ricky is a Batista exile, um, Batista era exile. So before Castro's come into power, you know, the guy before Castro was worse. <laughs> and, um, and, so Desi Arnaz is, is a man who, I mean, kind of, kind of honestly like tokenized himself, but in a way that's really quite interesting. And in Lucy, he's this, here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this sh short, but I, I know what I wanna say. If Lucy's like zany, funny quality is her ability to put on every hat and kind of do everything in a kind of clumsy, but fun way, What's funny about Ricky is that he is n always just failing all of his expectations as a like male performer husband. So yes, he's the performer. Yes, he's the breadwinner, but he can't really speak right. He can't really control his wife. He's barely holding on to his like normative household. And so for me, Ricky was this kind of slapstick masculinity. And so I really wanted to kind of do a poem about that and you know it's a little bit outside of the scope of the book but I thought it fit because it comes at the end of that sunburn section where it's all about um I think the line in in the Ricky Ricardo poem is my slapstick double tongue mm -hmm. um and there you go for anybody who's watched I Love Lucy like there's all these moments in which uh Ricky says something like instead of February he says February and Lucy like mimics him and so there's so much mimicking of ricky and uh in this section that's all about bilingualism i like just felt like he really made sense yeah i'm not a scholar of i love lucy uh, but <laughs> guess, well no but my period it's my period though you know it's the fifth sure, sure. but but uh, the, how close could you get to any kind of bilingual consciousness if you didn't do what desi arnaz did with that character yeah right like and you know he we know they are they are anti blacklist anti McCarthy and Desi Arnaz took some scripts that were quite left wing such as yeah. uh, such as uh, Rod Serling's early you know they didn't want to do Serling who was a real left winger and he was talking about uh, racism yeah uh, and genocide and it was Desi Arnaz who used his power to make that happen for CBS so you know he really I, I'm sure there's a lot of books about this but he really did there's something about your love of Ricky, that mm. is quite radical, I think, because you know you must somebody must ridicule you for liking Ricky. Ricky. For Rick liking Ricky, I don't think so. I mean, I love Lucy is a funny show, right? Because it's it's like it made the sitcom, but it's still like a weird sitcom. Like it's a very woman centered show where yeah. a woman works. Like the whole show is like a woman works, and it's always a little weird. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and Ricky's role in it is just super interesting to me. But yeah. I do love Ricky Ricardo. I mean, for me, Desi Arnaz is like a, it's like his, he's like my first, I feel like the first Latino people I saw on television were yeah. Ricky Ricardo, Desi Arnaz, and Charo. And I've written about both of them. Because Charo. Both, well, she's Spanish technically, but so both of them are just so fascinating to me because all of it's all the comedy of the mouth, you know? Charo's whole thing is like, oh, you don't understand what I'm doing, but then, She's this incredible guitarist. She's really smart. She's a super sharp comedian. But the right. whole thing is that she gets in the door by doing this slapstick 
language routine. And so that that was kind of really inspirational for the book. Gabe, this has been so great. I'm going to I'm going to read you some of the goodbyes and praises. So they're going to get their final word and then you'll get your final word in response to what they're saying. All right. Um, very creative and um, very creative concept and execution. Congrats on your books and thank you. Uh, Nadia Ghent, bravo, Gabe, thank you. Uh, this has been amazing, Gabe, thank you so much. Thanks, Gabe, great writing, loved listening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so grateful to be able to attend amazing reading, amazing poems. That's Amanda Helliwell. Patricia Milner, thank you, Gabe. I love Luis's thought about being a ghostwriter. Are all poets ghostwriters? Shari, thanks so much. Happy to discover your work. Jeremy from Wales, amazing reading, seen a whole new side of Gabe in terms of performance that I never knew was there. So glad I stayed up way past my bedtime. <laughs> and, there's, and then there's a little Welsh, which I won't try to read. Uh, Andrew Hugh, good hook, good, good night from the UK. Uh, thanks so much. I felt, oop, this thing just skipped. Thanks so much. I felt very attached to the rolling idea of home being currently non-existent, but also very real place in one's memory. It's the complicated relationship between language and home for me. Thank you for your work. I'm excited for it to be published. It's really cool, says Breyer, to think about the way Losing Miami plays with time, with your words about the time between writing and publishing, how poems have a period when they're finished, but not yet being read. Gabe, this was a very special evening, says MC from Jersey Shore. I'm so glad to have been here and especially love what you're saying about bilingualism. And I love Lucy and what it is to see oneself represented in society. My dad was Lucy's hairdresser. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. My dad was Lucy's hairdresser's doctor. Wow. Whoa, okay. And Deborah. <laughs> and Deborah's in LA. Deborah probably knows Louise. Uh, the word is misused a lot, but these were they were truly an iconic couple. So that's a goodbye to Lucy and, yeah. and Ricky. Uh, yeah, to comment on Ch Charo. <laughs> and then finally, uh, thank you very much, Gabe. I can't believe we ended on an inspirational story about Charo. Wow. <laughs> Wonderful. Just ordered your new book. Can't wait to sit down with it. Oh, and it's Mandana. Mandana saying, no, it's me, not MC, not the Jersey Shore. Mandana from New York. <laughs> Gabe, do you want to have a final word in response to all those wonderful people? Well, I can only say thank you to everybody. Thank you to Al, to you, Al, for your questions. And, and it's been quite a day. People don't know this maybe, but like me and Al have been on Zoom basically like all day long, header, yeah. <laughs> which has been good. Um, and though I can't see the YouTube comments, I'm going to go visit them later. And I'm thankful for yeah. everybody who tuned in. And, and uh, I look forward to continuing all our Great. conversations and stuff. Thank you, Gabe. It's been such a pleasure. This book, which is, is published, uh, Losing Miami, uh, and the, Gabe's edition of his uncle's work, and the title is? An Excess of Quiet. And that will be out a month from now, actually, weeks from now. Uh, and uh, it's very easy to find this book. You really just have to Google Losing Miami. There are many, many ways to get a copy. Um, and, uh, you, I th you know, really what you should do is keep an eye on what Gabe Ojeda Sege is doing, because I think his trajectory will not be as tragic as, Lu as Luis's. <laughs> that was a funny, weird, backhanded compliment way. <laughs> yeah. Let me start over and say, we're looking forward to all the books of poetry to come, starting with Madness. Thank you, Gabe, and thank, thank you, everybody. You. Rachel Dennis, Anthony Lagana, Nick Seymour for putting this on, and the people of the Writer's House. Thank you, Gabe, and good night to you. <laughs>